They are delicious, but. Oh. All right. So if we think about where we, what we've been talking about in terms of our notes, we started with cell, how cells reproduce, cell division, mitosis and meiosis. Then we talked about the human reproductive systems, the organs and structures that are present in um, humans that allow for reproduction. We talked about male reproductive organs, we talked about female reproductive organs. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about the process of fertilization, development, birth, and a few, few things related to that. So uh, that's where we're going. So we talked about the reproductive cycle that happens in women, and we also know that part of that process, an egg is released from the ovary. What's the name for that? The term we use for when an egg's released? Ovulation. 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 An egg inside of the ovary matures, it is released, and possibly fertilized. And so that's kind of where we're picking up here. So what does it mean when we say the word fertilized? You know, like it's fertilized. It's like, you know, like when the egg, when the wiggly worm comes in, you know, contact with the egg. So when a single sperm cell yeah. enters um, one of the an egg cell, we would say the egg cell's been fertilized. Yes. What is the sperm cell carrying? Uh, you know, the, the half the chromosomes. Right, 23, in humans, 23 chromosomes. What does the egg cell have inside of its nucleus? Also 23 chromosomes. So when they combine during fertilization, then we have a cell that will have 46 chromosomes, which is the typical amount in humans. So fertilization, we're talking mainly about humans, but it happens in all organisms that reproduce, actually plants. An egg cell has to be fertilized by a sperm cell. That happens in the flowers of the plant. Pollen contains a sperm cell. And in the female parts of the flower, there's egg cells. So flowering plants also reproduce sexually. And the process takes place in a similar way. Um, and so we have, remember these terms, we have the sperm cell, which has half the number of chromosomes, we call that haploid. We have the egg cell, which has half the number of chromosomes, it's haploid. When they combine, we have a full set of chromosomes, that's called diploid. And the very first stage is called a zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg cell. Cool. So we have a sperm cell and an egg cell, once they combine, that first cell is called a zygote. And what will happen to that zygote over time, that fertilized egg? Well, um, it will start to grow and grow. Okay, again. it will grow. It'll go from one cell, a zygote, into two cells. And then those two cells will, go, will grow into four cells. Each time, the number of cells doubles. And that process happens by mitosis. The single cell zygote is dividing by mitosis to two cells, and then four cells, and then eight cells, and 16 cells. The term for these first cell divisions is called cleavage. The cell has been cleaved in half. And so we have one cell, then two, and four, and eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. Eventually, it forms a whole little ball of cells with hundreds of cells. Eventually, this ball of cells becomes hollow. Then it starts to get an indentation that starts to form. Can you guess what the indentation is going to become? Um, uh, it's going to go all the way through the embryo eventually. Uh, maybe. That's the 
digest the tract. Oh, yeah. Right? That ends up turning into the mouth and the digestive tract. Okay? And eventually, in the early stages, every cell is basically identical to each other. They're just sort of generic. This is like a generic ball of cells. There's no skin cell or nerve cell or digestive. They're just all basically generic. But when we start to reach this stage, something happens. The cells start to what we call differentiate. They start to take on a specific job, a specific role. A, a cell in a person's brain is not the same as a cell in a person's digestive system or their skin. These cells take on unique characteristics and structures and functions. That process is called differentiation, when the cells start to become different from each other. That's what differentiation means. Just some pictures here. This shows an actual zygote. These are microscopic pictures of the very first stage. This is the fertilized egg. Yes. It's a zygote. Then that cell goes through mitosis. It forms these two cells. Each of those two cells goes through mitosis and forms four cells and so forth. And then we start to see this indentation forming through this embryo. Okay, so this is the very first stages of the development of an organism. We also see once differentiation starts, there's different parts of the embryo. They will eventually go on to become different parts of a person. So, for example, the outermost cells become the skin cells and become neurons in the brain. The middle section becomes the blood cells, muscle, other things. And then the innermost layer becomes um, pancreas cells and lung cells, etc. So they start to take on a different role. Now we're focusing on um, humans really, but just to mention it, other types of animals have different types of reproduction. And when we talk about reproduction in animals, we talk about where does the egg get fertilized by the sperm cell? Does that happen inside of the body or outside? Can anyone think of an animal where the sperm cells fertilize the egg outside of the body? Oh, birds. No, nope, not birds. Frogs. frogs. Right, in frogs, a female frog lays eggs. Oh, yeah. A male frog releases sperm into oh, the that. water. They fertilize the eggs just in the water, in a pond or a stream. Fish. Same with fish, right? Yeah, same with fish. We call it, like in fish, we call it spawning, where... The fish go, males and females go to the same place. The females release eggs when they spawn. The males release sperm. The, the egg cells get fertilized. So that's called external fertilization. Is that why it's called frog spawn? It's called spawning. That's the term for external fertilization. Uh, Other types of animals like mammals, birds, reptiles, the sperm fertilize the egg cell inside of the female's and body. And amphibians, don't forget those. Amphibians have external, um, external fertilization. They just lay eggs in the water and sperm in the water. What about insects? Um, insects typically, um, they could have either one sometimes, but often mostly external. So um, like they just lay eggs? Yeah, and then they get fertilized outside oh. in the environment. Um, mammals, birds, reptiles have internal fertilization. The male deposits sperm cells into the female reproductive tract. The sperm cells fertilize the egg, and then the eggs can develop. But then there's something else. The next question is, well then, what happens to those fertilized eggs? Where do they actually grow and develop? Inside. Sometimes. And what, what kind of animals do the embryos develop inside of the organism? You know, fetuses. Yeah, mammals, humans, have internal development. The, the embryo and fetus grow inside of the female. But that's not true of all animals. Some 
What about birds? Where do the young develop in birds? Eggs. They develop in eggs which are outside of the body. Yes. Right? So in birds, the egg cells fertilize inside the female's body, a shell forms around it, and then the female lays the egg, and the embryo grows in the egg outside of the body. So that's called development. So only mammals, I mean, there's some exceptions to this, have internal development. All the other species, basically, the embryos develop on the outside of the body, like a egg, a chicken egg, or a bird egg, or an insect egg, reptile eggs, fish and amphibians. They all develop on the outside, typically. But mammals are the only group where the young develop, or the embryos and fetuses develop inside. But there's actually some variation in mammals that you probably know a little bit about. Do you know anything about marsupials? Oh yes, marsupials are like a type of like rodents, or like you know, like koalas and. They're a type of mammals. Some are rodent-like, some are not. But they have koalas and. What do you, what's the first thing that kind of sticks out when we talk about a marsupial in Australia? Birth and. Oh well, they got they. Oh well, I thought those were. They got the pouches. They got the pouches. Yeah, pouches. What is the pouch about? Well, it's a type of thing that goes into the wrap. It's like kind of like a, like a little hole where so they keep their young. Do you know what happens in a, in a kangaroo bird? Anybody know how that happens? Comes they, out of the pouch. Well, first, there's like two births almost for a kangaroo. Oh. Okay. I have a picture here. Hold on. Those are mine. Oh, yeah. So here is a kangaroo newborn. Aw. It's, it's so in kangaroos. And other marsupials. So fertilization happens internally. Male deposits sperm in the reproductive tract, fertilizes an egg. In marsupials, however, the, the embryo develops only to a very, develops quickly and is not very mature when it's born. This is what the embryo of a kangaroo looks like. It is tiny. It can't really do anything. All it can do, it's born, and then it crawls up. It's got like only two limbs. It can scent, it can detect the scent of the mother's pouch. It crawls up into the pouch, goes in there, and then it nurses and really finishes the rest of its development there in the pouch. And then eventually it's developed enough that it can come out of the pouch, walk around, do its thing. Um, it's almost like the king who gives birth twice. Once this tiny little immature thing, which goes in the pouch and finishes its development. Uh -huh. So those are marsupials. Most of them are found where? Australia. Mostly Australia, but there are some marsupials here. Like the possum. A possum. Which you've probably seen, maybe you've seen them as roadkill more than you've seen them alive. Um, possums are around here. They're in North America. They're also marsupials. They, they give birth in the same way. Koalas and... A few other things um, are marsupials. So <clears throat> there's another group of um, mammals called monotremes. There's eggs. only a couple examples. And these are the examples. The platypus and the echidna. This is the platypus. Yeah, it's kind of a strange animal. When people first discovered platypus, they thought it was like a joke. They thought somebody had taken different parts of animals and taxidermy and, and just like sewed them together. Because it's got like a bill at the front of its um, yeah. at the front of its head. It's got like a beaver leg -like tail. It's got um, like, these claws that have venom. It's very Yeah, they got strange. no they're not claws or barbs, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And they're venomous. Um, but the platypus actually is a mammal but it lays eggs. It lays again tiny little eggs which eventually hatch into immature young, which have to nurse for a while until they mature. This is an echidna, sometimes called a spiny anteater. Same, same sort of thing, it's a monotreme. There's a little, little yeah, baby. Yeah, they like eggs. Did you know they have a two-headed? Yeah, similar. What? Oh, oh. So, yeah, did you know they have a two-headed? Penis? Yeah. Yes, I did know that. Um, Think about knuckles for a minute. So, um, then we have most mammals that were familiar with. Humans, dogs, cats, um, 
These are called placental mammals. Oh. And that's what we'll be talking about most. Is it the placental? So we're going to talk about it. So just uh, give me a minute here. Okay? I was just thinking. So placental mammals, such as humans, have internal fertilization. So again, the male deposits sperm in the female reproductive tract. Those sperm fertilize an egg. Then the embryo that's formed stays inside of the female's uterus and it attaches to the wall of the uterus, which as we just learned in our menstrual cycle activity, the lining of the uterus has been, getting, has been thickening. Blood vessels have been forming. It's been getting ready for this embryo to attach or implant into the side of the uterus. And a placenta is extremely important. A placenta is an organ that will form where the embryo attaches to the uterus, an organ called the placenta forms. Um, let me see for a second. So this is what a placenta really looks like. Yeah. What's attached to it? Um, yeah, the umbilical cord. Yeah, this is the umbilical cord. So placenta forms on the side of the uterus. Uh -huh. On this model, this is the placenta. Okay, so the placenta form, it's got lots of blood vessels. That's why it looks like this. And um, what's interesting is that the blood from this fetus and the blood from the mother, they don't actually mix together. No. They're cut separate from each other. What happens is blood from the fetus goes out through the umbilical cord to the placenta. And in the placenta, the capillaries from the fetus are right next to the capillaries from the mother. And what that means is things can diffuse back and forth. Like food. So like nutrients from the mother's blood diffuse in the placenta to the fetus's blood. And oxygen uh -huh. diffuses into the blood of the embryo of the fetus. Waste products from the fetus diffuse into the mother's blood. So really, when it's developing, the embryo and fetus, it never needs to eat. It never needs to breathe. It never needs to urinate. It doesn't need to do those things because that's how the mother is doing those things for the embryo and fetus. The first time the fetus breathes is after it's born. First time it needs to eat is after it's born. So if I go back here a minute. If you cut it off, it turns into a belly button. Um, so yeah, the, so the capillaries within the placenta run next to each other. Things can diffuse back and forth. Um, and also what that means is that harmful substances can also diffuse through that placenta. Um, toxins, alcohol, um, drugs, heavy metals, things can move from the mother's blood into the fetus's blood. And so that's why when a woman is pregnant, that she'll be advised not to smoke, not to drink, not to take drugs, because some of those things can have a serious impact on the fetus that's developing, especially in the early stages. In the beginning stages of the development of the embryo, all of the major organs and organ systems are forming early on. And so if things are, if there are toxins, if there's dangerous things that get to the embryo during that time, they can have serious impacts on the embryo, on its health, on its development. And so that's why it's important for women to know when they're pregnant and to avoid certain things, to eat a healthy diet, because that embryo that's growing also needs a lot of nutrition to grow. So here's some diagrams. We got again. We see the placenta. We see the umbilical cord, which brings the blood from the fetus back to the placenta and out. Um, eventually, after the um, birth. after the birth of the of the baby, the placenta breaks away from like in this this model. After this this fetus was born. Um, that's exactly how it Yeah, it's pretty much just like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I've seen it three times, that's how it works. Um, this placenta, after the baby's born, breaks away from the inside, okay. and then it is delivered after the baby comes out. So, so yes. the placenta comes out through the cervix, through the vagina, after the child is born. Um, I have a good friend who's a nurse, and he became a nurse when he was in high school, actually, at the very end. And he's seen, yeah. been a nurse for a long time. But the first time he was uh, observed at birth, it, he uh, was there and he was very young. He was, you know, still learning a lot. He um, he was in, he was just watching, and the, the woman was pregnant. She had the baby. And then the nurse told the mother to keep pushing. And so my friend, this nurse, like, oh, my God, it's twins. Um, but it wasn't actually twins, but she just was telling her to push so the placenta would come out next. And he was really embarrassed that he said he, he didn't realize why she was telling him to keep pushing. But, um, yeah, Do you know that some people eat their placenta? Yeah, so um, there are some, yeah, and there was like, uh, do you know this one, the Kardashians? No. I never watched the Kardashians. So uh, there was an episode in one of the beginning of the Kardashians where, I don't know which one, I don't know them all. But one of them gave birth, and some people do um, eat it. Like they have a tradition of cooking and eating the placenta. It's not, it's, it's not weird. I mean, it's I not mean, cannibalism. It's if you cut off your arm right. and cook it up and eat it, is that cannibalism? Yeah, That's kind of cannibalism. Yeah. You're someone so, else. Um, I don't know really how common this is, but I have heard of it. Um, and in the, in the Kardashians, it's, it's very they like pranked, they, they just told them they did that. They didn't actually do it. Um, so, uh, animals do it frequently. So animals, um, frequently after the the animals born, the mother might eat the placenta. Why? Um, it so has nutrients nutrition the and it has protein and things like that. So. I am, if I ever step on my arm, I'm going to eat it. All right. No. So here is the beginning stages of the development. So this would be after, obviously, an egg was fertilized became a zygote. As it was traveling through the oviduct, it was dividing. It was growing into that ball of cells. It started to form um, different tissues. Eventually it goes into the uterus and attaches to the thickened lining of the uterus. And it starts to develop different structures. There is a tiny little yolk in human embryos in the beginning. That's where the embryo gets the energy to divide but it runs out pretty quickly. Eventually, this embryo attaches to the wall of the uterus, and around it forms a sort of um, membrane that's called the amniotic sac, and it's filled with fluid. And the embryo will stay in that amniotic sac throughout all of its growth and development. You could see here the beginning stages of the umbilical cord, bringing the blood out to the placenta and bringing the blood back. And again, this placenta is where um, the exchange of materials between the mother and the fetus takes place. Um, here's what some of the stages look like. Um, these are the beginning stages of embryonic development, right from day one which would be a zygote, when the egg was just fertilized. And through the process, this is um, 60 days. Okay, So that's about eight weeks or so. This is the embryonic stages of development. It's um, And you can see it grows quite a bit in size. By the time we get to 10 weeks or so, um, their organ systems are starting to form. By the time we reach this embryonic stage, many of the systems have been formed. These are the stages when problems like alcohol or drugs or lack of proper nutrition can really have a large impact on the embryo because it's in the process of forming organ systems. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this process. First of all, fertilization, combination of sperm and egg. This happens in the oviduct. <laughs> so remember, the sperm cell need to make their way after, um, after sex from the vagina, through the cervix, through the uterus, 
all the way up into the oviduct or fallopian tube. That's where they can fertilize them. There's a pretty short window in which that can happen because the egg is traveling down the oviduct. The sperm cells can live for a couple days. So there's a, a window of when a woman can become pregnant. It's around ovulation. And once that fertilized egg starts, then the embryo goes through mitosis hundreds and thousands of times. It gets to the wall of the uterus where it attaches. And then the placenta starts to form. An umbilical cord grows to connect the, the embryo to the placenta. An amniotic sac forms around it, filled with fluid. That helps to cushion the embryo as it's developing, as it's growing. Okay, so some terms. So when we talk about um, prenatal, that means before, natal means birth. So prenatal times are the time before the uh, fetus is born. We call the first cell the zygote. A single fertilized egg cell is a zygote. Once it divides, we start to use the term embryo for eight weeks. After eight weeks, we typically use the term fetus about this growing organism. And that eventually form, and that's the postnatal period. How long does it take in humans uh, for the eight weeks? embryo to grow, or for the zygote to grow and be born? A month or two. How long is a pregnancy? Nine months. We, some, we often will say nine months. It's a little bit longer, really. Weeks are probably better. 40 weeks is like what's typically thought of as um, the full peer, gestational period. Um, normal is like plus or minus two weeks. So sometimes fetus is born early earlier than was expected, sometimes a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> sometimes a, a woman can go into labor prematurely and before the um, fetus is fully developed. Right? And depending on the earlier that happens, the more dangerous it can be for the fetus. Right? There is a point at which uh, the fetus is born too early can't survive because the organ systems are still in the process of forming. The lungs are one of the last organs to mature and develop. So when a child is born premature, often they'll need to be taken care of, um, or maybe a ventilator used to help them breathe. There's certain medications they can use to try to help their lungs develop more quickly. But because lungs are one of the last organs to develop, premature, uh, births can have a risk because that hasn't happened yet. Oh. Um, doctors can can do a test. They can take a sample of the fluid that surrounds the fetus. Oh. It's called amniotic fluid, and they can do a, a test called an amniocentesis. Basically, they use a needle and withdraw a little bit of that fluid. And what's in it are actually cells of the fetus. And so they can use those cells to test for different genetic conditions, chromosome differences. Uh, they can tell um, the sex chromosomes by looking at those cells. What kind of, what do we call this? A fetus. Well, the picture. Oh, I see. Uh, it wasn't a C section. It's a. It's a sonogram. sonogram. So a sonogram is basically using sound waves. There's a little tool where you the tool uses sound waves to kind of make a picture of what's inside. You could get a sonogram or an ultrasound, they're the same thing, for other parts of your body. Like if you hurt your knee, they might do an ultrasound um, to see what's going on inside your knee. It's a way of imaging inside. Um, and so this is a sonogram. Often it's done. Um, you know, 10 weeks or so after, and 
They can check lots of different things by looking at this image, check proper heart development, the size of the, of the embryo, how old it is approximately, things like that. Sometimes they can tell um, if it's uh, male or female, depending on its orientation. Sometimes um, pregnancies end it when the fetus can't survive for some reason, or doesn't survive for some reason. About 10 to 20% of pregnancies end in what we call miscarriage, when they um, die. the embryo and fetus doesn't fully develop and doesn't survive. It's very sad. And so that's pretty common. Um, and it does happen, and for different reasons, and sometimes for unknown reasons as well. It's very sad. So when development is complete, when we're reaching the end stage, it's not we, I should have said we, I'm not going to have a child, but when um, a pregnant woman is reaching full development at 38 or 40 weeks, um, she's going to give birth to the child. Yeah. How, what... What's one of the ways that a woman might know, hey, I'm having this baby soon? Water, Water breaks. breaks. Yeah, what does that actually mean? The amniotic sac breaks. Yes, the amniotic sac that the fetus is surrounded in, that's filled with fluid, at some point it often ruptures, it breaks. And then that fluid leaks out through the cervix, through the vagina. And so if that happens, then a woman knows, oh, I'm going to have this, this baby soon. I just thought the baby go pee. No, and then it doesn't come from the bladder, and it's not urine, so it feels different for a woman. Um, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes labor can start before, and that doesn't, uh, the amniotic sac doesn't rupture. Um, but often it does. And typically the doctor wants the woman to have the child give birth within about 24 hours. Because once the amniotic sac breaks, then there's the possibility that bacteria could enter. So they really want the woman to give birth within about 24 hours. So often the amniotic sac ruptures. Um, and then the fetus starts to drop lower into the uterus and starts to press against the cervix. The cervix is the opening of the uterus. And that causes this hormone cycle to start. That there are um, hormones that are produced when the fetus presses against the uterus that cause the uterus to contract. And so contractions, so the uterus is basically a muscle. This is the uterus. It's a muscle. Yeah. It's, and the fetus is in there. And it, like all muscles, it can contract. Oh, that must hurt. And so in the beginning stages, when a woman starts labor, contractions of the uterus, they are spread out. Maybe they happen every 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And often they're mild and a woman can feel it happening. Um, but as labor <coughs> progresses, as the uterus contracts, it pushes the fetus more against the cervix which releases more hormones, which causes more contraction, which pushes the fetus more, which causes more. So we have this positive feedback loop. And so the contractions become closer together. They happen sooner. They become more intense. And in this process, what's happening is the opening of the uterus, okay? the cervix is dilating. It has to open up to allow the fetus to come out. It's becoming thinner. It's called the facing to make it more flexible so the fetus can come out. And so as the uterus is contracting, okay, the fetus gets pushed down into the cervix, which is dilated and thinned, and eventually starts to make its way out of the cervix, out of the uterus and into the vagina. Um, and so at that point, so up to this point, everything that's been happening for the woman that's giving birth is um, involuntary. Like she, her uterus is just contracts. She doesn't need to do anything. It's just, 
is happening. As the fetus makes its way into the vagina, then we get into the delivery, we call that delivery. And at that time, in a, in a typical vaginal birth, a woman would sort of push, contract her muscles to move the fetus through the vagina and out into the world. Um, the typical position for the fetus is head first. Okay. That's, that's the way in which the fetus moves more easily through the cervix, through the pelvis. Um, it sort of turns as it's being born. But there are times when the fetus is in a different position. It could have, it could be feet first. Okay, it could be sideways. And so in those conditions, sometimes the doctor might try to move the fetus so that it can be born head first more easily. Um, sometimes that can't happen. And so after the, the fetus has been born, it's been pushed out, through the vagina, the placenta breaks off from the uterus. That comes out afterwards. Okay, and then once that breaks off, then the fetus needs to start to breathe on its own. The child needs to start breathing on its own because it's no longer getting oxygen from the placenta because it's separated from the wall of the uterus. There are times when a vaginal birth through the vagina is not happening uh, quickly enough or that the fetus is in distress. When a woman is in the process of labor and delivery, the, the doctors and nurses monitor um, the heart rate of the fetus. They monitor the, blood, the oxygen levels of the fetus. And if they drop, then the doctor may decide that they need to um, take the fetus out more quickly to help it, to maintain its health. And they might do what's called a C-section. A C-section is basically a, a surgery. So a woman has to go into a surgical suite where a doctor would do a surgery and basically um, cut through the skin of her abdomen, cut through the abdominal muscles, Below that's the uterus, cut through the uterus, and then rupture the amniotic sac, and then basically take the fetus out through this incision rather than having it be born through the vagina. Um, so that's a C-section. Um, it's so typically doctors don't want it. This is so it takes longer. It's more risky for the mother's health for the fetus's health, um, it takes a lot longer for a woman to recover from a C-section because all those <coughs> muscles and incisions need to heal. So the doc a doctor would like to avoid a C-section if at all possible, but sometimes it's not a good um, I had was too big and my mom had to have an emergency C-section. Yeah. And yeah. she hasn't let me let it down. Oh, she brings it up? No, all the time. <laughs> Especially on my birthday. Oh, wow. Ah, you should oh. be celebrating me. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah, it happens. With my daughters, all of them, um, their like, umbilical cord was pretty short. And so as like labor was going on, their um, heart rates were always dropping. And so we, my wife never had to have a C-section, but lots of times like the they have monitors and the alarms go off and they have to like they flip her on her side or try to move things because sometimes if the umbilical cord gets compressed or, or smushed um, it can reduce the flow of blood to the fetus so those are kind of situations where they might want to consider c-section we'll come back to this in a minute twins let's talk about twins the so there's two types of twins. Identical, identical okay. and fraternal. Um, identical twins form. So we already talked about an egg cell gets fertilized, starts to divide into an embryo. Sometimes that embryo splits into two, and each of those 
becomes its own fetus, embryo and fetus. And those go on and plant and grow in the uterus. But because they came from the same sperm cell and the same egg cell, they have the exact same chromosomes. Those are identical twins. They're always the same sex because they have the same sex chromosomes. Um, and they will have the exact same DNA, basically. They will look identical to each other. The other type of twin is called a fraternal twin. Sometimes when a woman is ovulating, she might not just release a single egg from an ovary. Sometimes she might release two eggs, or sometimes even three. And if two or three of those eggs all get fertilized by different sperm cells, those embryos can go on and plant, grow, but they're not identical to each other because each of them came from a different egg cell and a different sperm cell with different combinations of chromosomes. So they're really not any more similar than, than siblings would be. Those are called fraternal twins. There are even some cases in which, uh, oh, those are the reasons. You guys have this? Could you have to write it? Okay. Um, there are also some times when I, <coughs> identical twins start to form. The embryo starts to break apart, but it doesn't fully separate. And those two identical twins are still connected in a small way and actually develop sharing certain organs. We call that conjoined twins. They're always connected like the same, like chest to chest or head to head or hip to hip. They're always connected at the same location. And sometimes after they're born, they can try to do surgery to separate them. But it depends on which organs they share and how much of the organs they share. In some cases, they share vital organs and there's only one liver, for example. Or there's only, um, you know, the circulatory system is too shared with each other for them to be separated, actually. And they, have, they live their life conjoined together. There was like a TV show about conjoined twins. Wow. Yeah, was it? I think it was a TLC. Yep. A type. Was it Siamese or two headed? I think it was two headed. They're like, we call them conjoined twins. Oh. Siamese is like yeah, the yeah, oldest it's, term used to be used. Yeah, it's, well, actually, it's just like two people connected by like a single piece of tissue. Yeah. Um, Pretty cool. Okay, and then I'm the last saying, in terms of what? Oh, that was, that was in terms of um, human reproduction. So birth control, ways of avoiding pregnancy, um, there's a variety of different, and we've talked about a couple of these already. So um, to avoid getting pregnant, there's several things that um, people can do. One is not having sex, call that abstention. So obviously in order to get pregnant, a woman has to have sex. A man has to deposit sperm in the vagina to fertilize an egg. So... Without that, there can be no pregnancy. Although, there are certain surgical procedures where um, a sperm cell can be uh, used to fertilize an egg cell outside of the woman's body and then implanted into her uterus where she can become pregnant. It's called in vitro fertilization. Um, trying to time when a couple has sex so they avoid the window of ovulation, that sometimes people try to do that. And we'll look at another graphic in a minute, but it's not very reliable because there's a window of how long sperm survive, ovulation is not always predictable. So if um, a couple mistimes that, then they can get pregnant. There's lots of hormonal birth control options, mostly all, completely for women. So there's not a birth control pill that men can take, um, but there are several different types of hormonal birth control that women can take. They are developing one for men. Yeah, it's not available yet, right? But yeah, it would have to be something that prevented sperm from either forming or prevented them from being able to fertilize the egg. So lots. Of, sometimes it's a pill. There's an uh, oral, contra we call these things contraception preventing pregnancy. There's oral pills that women can take um, that have hormones. 
progesterone or estrogen that stop her from ovulating. There's injectable hormones that can be used um, as well. There's other types. Using a barrier, so like a condom prevents sperm from entering the vagina so that woman doesn't become pregnant. There's a diaphragm as a device a woman can insert into the vagina that prevents sperm from being able to swim their way to the egg. Um, there are also some more longer lasting methods. Intrauterine devices are a small um, device that's inserted by a doctor in a doctor's office into a woman's uterus that prevents her from getting pregnant. And it can stay in there for years. So it's like a long-term form, but it's also removable. So if she decides she does want to get pregnant, it can be removed and she can get pregnant afterwards. And then there's the permanent methods. We talked about a vasectomy in a man or tubal ligation, tubes tied in a woman. Those are permanent. That's for when people say, I, know, I don't want to have any more children ever. And it's a permanent method of birth control. And these things all, it's important to note, like these things prevent pregnancy, but most of them do not prevent diseases, sexually transmitted diseases. Condoms would be one that does, but these other things prevent pregnancy, but not diseases that can be spread sexually. And so we can see sort of like how well do these things work, okay? Um, this, these are the less, least effective, okay? This is um, like trying to time when a couple has sex, um, has a 24% failure rate, which is not good. It means 20, or, yeah, 24 quarter of the time, a woman could become pregnant. Um, condoms are more, more reliable, but not super reliable. The injectable or, or birth control pills, patches, those are, you know, in the 6 to 10% really. IUD, intrauterine device, that's very, very effective. Um, and then obviously the permanent methods are very effective as well. So those are all different ways of avoiding, um, avoiding pregnancy. All right, let's let's stop here. I know that's a ton of notes. Uh, I got a couple of videos I wanted to show.